Welcome. It's, it's great. Uh, thanks for getting up early for me. <laughs> thanks for coming in so early. So, first of all, I tricked you a bit. This talk used to be called Serialization Protocols in Scala, but since it's DevOps, I just quickly renamed it. But, um, there will be some Scala samples, but nothing to worry about. And in the end, it's all about distributed systems. So it's only halfway a trick. Um, so, and with every talk that I want to do, it's, it's very important to me to start with a why. Like, why should you care? Why should you spend time on listening to this and thinking about this and even implementing this in your software? So I think I have a few good reasons here in my, in my backpack to show you why you should care about serialization protocols. Um, and to start with, I think in the last five years or a bit later, system designs have been changing, right? We've, I've been around for a bit. You might be around for even longer. We've all built these nice monoliths with their relational databases. But nowadays, things are really, really changing quickly. Like I remember five years ago, I was at meetups. People were giving all these microservice talks, and everything was awesome. And now we build them, and everything is terrible. But um, they are there, and there's they still have their valid benefits for, for s lots of organizations. So they are mainstream now. And it's not just microservices, but also queues or message brokers who you dress up nicely as queues and pretend they're queues. They show up in the architectures. So uh, Kafka you see everywhere, you see PubSub everywhere. Um, and command query responsibility segregation, CQRS, and Event sourcing, not everybody knows that maybe, but um, it comes up all the time even more. I've built these kind of systems and they're really nice, but they're also distributed by their design. And hopefully, hopefully, really, if I, I'm looking at your faces now, no one's using databases as an integration layer anymore, right? Right? If you don't, I come for you. <laughs> I'll find you. Um, so, yeah, designs are changing, and I like this, this quote from Tim Perrette very much that said, distributed systems are about protocols, not about the implementation. Don't, don't care so much about the languages, the protocols between your distributed things. They are what matter in the long run. Um, and Rebecca Parsons and Neil Ford from, from ThoughtWorks also have a nice blog post and they wrote a book with Patrick Kua on evolutionary architectures. They have this nice quote in there that says uh, evolution, trying to define what that means is evolutionary architecture is something that supports incremental non-breaking change as a first principle along other dimensions. And I really, really agree with this quote because at least just for me, I build systems and everything I build, I assume to be terrible. Like every, so I try to make sure that I can change things later. Th this is the most important design aspect I have in mind when, when designing systems, when building systems. I screw up everything, so at least give me the chance to fix it later. Um, so, and b before these quotes were out, I, I tried to come up with something on my own, and I like to define evolvability, the word, as the ability of a system and its data to attempt to change because I didn't found anything better. And kind of this now plays in, right? If we have all these distributed systems, there are things moving up and down and uh, changing all the time. And the things beneath, between these systems, they need to change as well. So just a blast from the past, how, how we used to do stuff, right? We had our nice monolithic system, our big JEE, mega container and we had our big Oracle database which costs us the price of a boat every year. And when we wanted to change something, then we would do a schema migration of the database. Yeah, some poor ops guy would have to run this schema migration and it would hopefully not break. And you would do your code changes and deploy them in the, in a matter of just a couple months. And you would do one big bang release deployment and it was out there and everything was good. But nowadays, this doesn't fly anymore because 
I mean, even the tiniest stuff. I'm, I'm now working for a small startup in Munich, and we're a team of five, and we have a website, essentially, a search engine in a website, but even we run a replicated system, if, in, if it's just multiple instances of a Spring Boot application. But so even the, the tiniest teams come up with re replicated systems. You replicate your Postgres database around all the time. And so everything gets spread out because our CPUs don't get faster. We ha just have to spread out the pain. And in our data center, we have all these distributed systems. We have Kubernetes coming up everywhere. And some, some wild, wild people are already doing serverless and pushing this further, I guess, by, by next year, I will delete the anyone and add the everyone because we all need to be on board of the hype train. And something people forget about, and it's something I keep continuing to forget about it, even though I talk about it, is most of our systems already also distribute some code to the user. And mostly that's JavaScript, right? You have a front end, and your front end gets very complicated, and it also suddenly holds state. And in your, your front end or in your local cache on the browser, there's, or it's even an offline application, you also have data in the browser which means that your system is terribly distributed. It's not, not just longer six, ten things where you put, put it, you put it to a million of devices suddenly. So things get just spread around. That's, that's the message. And these systems, they exchange information. Th that's their point, right? Otherwise, they would be pretty boring. And they do it all the time. And um, that's why we need evolvable systems, because everything will be changing at different rates. Right, you have different teams, different environments, everything comes up and down. And we somehow need to tie this all together to make it a working system. And small interrupt, because yeah, we're, we're all software engineers here, we like to create names. And this is a clarification just because there's so many names around. If you wanna want data to go out of your system into some static representation, you can either call it encoding, you can call it serializing, or you can call it marshalling depending on how the wind blows. But uh, for the sake of this talk, I will go with serializing because it's hard to pronounce. And on, on the other way around, to get your data back, you need to either decode it, deserialize it, or you need to unmarshal it. Again, if it's sunny, you might call it decode. But let's go with deserialize in, for the sake of this talk. So now the idea is how can we deal with all these, these problems, right? I, I cannot just come here with problems. I should offer you at least a halfway working solution. And if you start naively, like I usually do, I, I just think everything will be easy and just start and then it will blow up. Um, we have the usual suspects. And the, very, the easiest one of suspects, if you want to write down some data or s serialize data to some other system is hey, we have a JVM, we have a JDK, we can use Java serializable. It's for free, it's always there, you can assume it's there. And now this is the slide where you um, put out the photos. You don't, please. For, for all intents and purposes, and if there's one thing you take home from this talk, don't use Java serialization. It's the worst thing after null. Um, really, <laughs> stay away, it, it's, it's a train wreck. Um, just the easiest, uh, the, the smallest reasons to not do it first, you're bound to JVM implementation languages, theoretically. Like if, if you try to deserialize something in Kotlin or in Scala, which was serialized by Java, it, it could work potentially, but it probably won't. So essentially you're bound to Java, which is not very good in distributed systems because there will probably be more than Java. Um, the performance, it's god awful. Usually you don't care, but it's still incredibly slow. And it has serious, serious, serious drawbacks. Like, again, uh, don't trust me, trust, trust this guy, Joshua Bloch, who wrote Effective Java that hopefully everybody has read if you work with Java. I can recommend to, I try to reread it every two, three years if, if I have the time. Um, implement it ridiculously, if I pronounced that right. Because, well, if you serialize things in Java, it decreases your flexibility to change once released because you have written something now about it's out there, your class. 
And if you want to ever read it again, you better not change that class. And this is bad. This is really a bad idea. Um, and if you think further about this, because you serialize the whole thing out, how serialization works, it just dumps everything you have there. Um, the implementation, the most inner workings of your class, since it's out there, it's your API. And everything you learned about software design is you should hide implementation details and do abstract interfaces. Uh, you're doing the complete opposite with serialization. You're giving everything out, which means everything you have is suddenly the API of your system. And you can imagine how easy that stuff breaks. And so this increases the likelihood of bugs, but also since what the JVM has to do to ingest this data later is it just takes it and tries to stuff it in a class. And it has to be pretty naive about it because it does not know what it gets. So you open up the possibility for security holes tremendously because the, the JVM has to read whatever crap is in there. And it has to assume it's useful to, to make serialization work. So you can pass anything you want there. So please, please, please stay away. And of course, it decreases your testing burden by a factor of a gazillion because everything you ever serialized, you have to deserialize again. So you probably want to test that. Um, and there was also Mario Fusco who at, I think, DevOps Antwerp in last year made a, uh, made a survey of other pe of some Java architects and this is, these are the things that they are bothered the most about, or they are annoyed the most about inventing it. They, the stuff they feel sorry for, and number one is really serialization, as well with finalize, but that's another talk. So don't believe just me, believe these other guys with the big names that uh, serialization is a terrible thing. And also from my personal experience, when I was working with Akka Remoting, Default serialization broke and it bit me. When I was working with Akka Cluster, serialization broke, it bit me. When I was working with Spark, it bit me. And lastly, because I keep making, I keep making mistakes. <laughs> I keep making the same mistakes sometimes. Uh, just recently we serialized our user sessions to the user and to be stored at, uh, in the browser cache and then tried to reread re this. Now guess what, it was serialized. It's, um, so, trust me, I, I keep messing this up, even if I give, t give talks about it. Um, and some, some small notes about performance. Don't read every number, it's not too much important. You can read it up on the JVM Serializers Wiki. But the most important part, if you just skip the total, um, and this number, that's roughly a factor of 10 or a factor of 20 of these guys. So. These are the ones we're going to be looking at, Protobuf, Drift, Cryo, Cryo and Avro. And um, this, the Scala implementation of the serializ serializer, just performance-wise, it's terrible. That's all you need to know. And you can read up the details. Um, so yeah, if, if it's one of our four that I show you, it's probably fast enough. If you're sitting here and you want to build a high-frequency trading platform later, or doing something really crazy big, you might do some uh, additional research for everybody else there building your day-to-day -day systems. It's gonna be fine. Um, just don't use the serializer. I keep, I keep saying this. I'll, I'll just say it every slide just to be sure. Um, so now the next in our line of obvious solutions is, is JSON. Or if you still party like it's 1996, you could use XML. Um, because these things are widespread, right? And JSON works very well with JavaScript and they are somewhat human readable. Some people prefer them because they can look into the data going back and forth. But I usually prefer computers reading that stuff and not me. So I'm not too convinced, but um, so the reasons why I'm not covering these is it's still slow depending on the benchmark that you ask. It's verbose, so it takes a lot of bytes over the wire if you wanna optimize for, for low bytes, you don't want to use that. More important, number handling in JSON is completely broken, right? Like most things in JavaScript, but number handling is especially broken. And character encoding too is difficult. So 
luckily we're people don't believe me if I give this talk, for example, in the United States, because they do ASCII, that's enough. And as in a country like the Ukraine, you know that there's more to the world than ASCII, there's UTF-8. Um, you have funny characters as, as I have as a German. So th this stuff gets suddenly very tricky with, with JSON and XML. So I, I'm not going to cover these. And for also, there's, there's no way of or there is a way of doing schemas for JSON, and I, I'm currently trying to work with them, but it's not as good as the ones that I'm covering. So if you want to describe what your data really is, you're going to have some trouble. And with, with XML schemas, you know them there. They are there, but I prefer not to look at them ever again in my life. Um, so next big point, schema evolvability. That's, that's the main point of, of the talk, is that just a, a simple example, right, where the simplest web app you can possibly build, you need a Kubernetes cluster and you need a queue, obviously, because that's the simplest thing you, you can have. Just imagine you have different instances of your application running. There was, at one point, there was a 0 0.9 version of your application writing some data, and you're now deploying your version 2 of your application and they all write messages to the message queue, but there's still the, the old ones, the old instances around, and there's even very old data around, so th this is, I think, nowadays a common use case. Stuff just, just keeps lingering, and you want your app version 1 to be reading all this old data, and probably also the new data, without dying, preferably. So it's always nice if your software does not die because some, some weird data comes in. And this, this is what I mean about schema evolvability, that we find a way to encode, or to serialize, sorry, data into some place so that everybody can read it again. Th this is the point of, of protocols. So and if you want to break that problem down, you have two, two problems to solve. The first one is backwards compatibility, which means and old, uh, a newer schema can read old data. So if you look at this slide, that would mean this application can read dot .09 and dot .1 data. So always going forward. This is backwards compatibility. It's, this is somehow doable because you know what has been there, right? You know how the dot .09 worked, you know how the dot .1 worked, so you can build some ifs and ifs and more ifs and if, 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 and y you, you can figure it out if you want to. I don't just load things dependently, um, because you were aware of what happened in the past. Now, the other way around of looking into the future is a bit more tricky. <laughs> I haven't figured that one out yet, right? You, if you want to read data from something that you don't know how it will be, this is very tricky. And this is, you cannot if, if, if somehow. But um, what you can do is leave that to a protocol, because this is what they're really good at. So we let protocols handle this for you. And in this talk, we'll check out these, these four players, Protobuf, Thrift, Avro, and Cryo. And there will be, be some samples. So starting with Protobuf. Protobuf is from Google. It's their language-neutral, platform-neutral, extensible mechanism for serializing. So they want to cover everything because they're Google, they're mighty. And so think XML, but smaller, faster, and simpler, which is nice, sounds good. Um, and um, the good thing this time is, I mean, we've all seen all a lot of things from Google coming out and then dying very silently. And as soon as you build your system on top of that, it goes away and it's not supported anymore. This time, they can't. Um, because they build it as the core of their Google Cloud platform that they need to make money, and they build it on top of gRPC. So that stuff will stick around. That's the one they cannot get rid of. Um, just some samples for the implementation, just, just a quick teaser. Um, how that stuff works, you need a compiler that takes your schema, I will show you a schema later, and compiles it to a class, so you can work with it. And then other people in other languages can also compile their schema to whatever they need, and now you can suddenly exchange messages. So 
Uh, Google provides the Pro to C compiler, and they provide a plugin for Gradle. I'll show you a sample later that will create a really crazy class that where you can map and serialize and work with protobuf data. And in the Scala world, there's Scala PB, which is also, uh, I think, supplied by Google. It's a protobuf buffer, buffer compiler plugin, so it uses Pro to C. And this will create Scala case classes and parses and serializes whatever you need. I'll just show you both so you can see how nice Scala is and be a little jealous. And <laughs> but all in all, it's, um, it's pretty simple. So let's do a very simple schema. Uh, there's a person. It has a user ID. It has a first name and a last name. We can do a package annotation where it should generate a class in. And we, do, we define the syntax. I'll talk about that stuff later because that's the fun part about protobuf. Um, and if we now look at this, give me the right one. So um, have a nice test. Um, if you look at this again, it's it's Scala, but but don't be scared. Um, should I make it bigger? Of course. Oh, nice. No, it went. So you you have seen the file before, but uh, just just to prove it to you. This is my schema that will be compiled by the magical compiler to a, cl a case class that has a nice builder pattern for me. Um, I can create my original person. I can write it to a file. And I can read it again. And what I also did for, for this example, you can afterwards download it on, on GitHub. Everything is in, in one. Uh, sample. What I did is extend actually, th because this one, this guy has um, the favorite conference. It's added data, and I have a test that I can read the old stuff. So I have a serialization done in um, from the old file and from the new file, and my test can read, or I have a test for each, so I can read old stuff and I can read new stuff. And let's. Um, are there Scala developers in here? Cool. So let's make a quick excursus to, to how you have to set it up. It's actually pretty nice. Um, if you have your plugin, um, oh sorry, I'm not. I'm in the wrong file. You just need an SPT plugin for SPT Pro to C and a, a dependency, and your you're good to go. I have a sub um, a sub project where the stuff is loaded. You can define where your source files are, and you can tell it. Um, no, you don't have to because you have the package annotation, and it will generate your your classes. And that's all you have to do to work with with Protobuf. So, and let's check out a file on on the disk. So. I showed you this um, this files that come up out of out of our test. We have one here. This is the simple file. Let's see if I can get that even bigger. This is the byte representation of the file as it was written. As you can see, you see the actual string that I had in my text. Uh, in my test, I was I was skipping the user ID because it's optional. Everything's optional. And you see the, um, the initial text. But you see a few wonky characters in there. And let's, let's quickly go over that so just you can see how, how obvious really protobuf is. If you look at the first byte, they were pretty, um, where's my binary here? Here it is. I'm sorry that this tool cannot make it any bigger. But it just, <laughs> oh, it's terrible to read. Um, uh, if you look at that, um, the first byte, it's 0001, which says, this is my field number one. And then you have the second half of the byte is just one zero, which tells us that it's a string. So each protobuf just contists, consists of one starting byte that tells you the number and the type. And 
Then you get the second byte, which is nine, because now comes nine characters. And then there come nine characters. And the play starts over again with um, our, f our t um, field number three and our type zero one of string again. And this time it's three characters because my last name is pretty short. And you get exactly three bytes for my last name. So it's, it's pretty condensed, but it's also pretty flexible. You can leave out things. Like I said uh, in the beginning, sorry, I was wrong about this. It starts with one zero, which means now comes field two. So you can have arbitrary ordering, you can leave out things, you can add new things. It will just look for field number two and the type and then map it. And that makes it really, really condensed. So and here I wrote it together again. You have the type, the ID, and the length, and the actual payload. So short X-course for Proto, uh, Proto 3 because there was protobuf2 before, and protobuf2 had a notion of required fields. Sometime, something you would, again, na naively think required things are good, because sometimes I want to make sure that uh, a user has a name or something. But then you find out, again, like me, everything I do is terrible, and everything I do is wrong in the beginning. So you have stuff that doesn't make any sense, for example, last name I just in the last time we we worked with Brazilians don't I tell you the Brazilians and their notion of last names it's crazy they have they have six last names and what the real last name is they choose by random so and just a field last name won't cut it if you want to work internationally like everything no matter how obvious it is it is wrong and, <laughs> and you have to be able to change it um, so what they and if you have it required you have to stick around with it forever. You can never unrequire something. So what happened at Google is that at some point they made the, the source or the coding style decision to never use the required because it just keeps propagating and fills the fields and then you always the comment like this field is required but don't use it anymore because now we have a, a better one. So and because Google can do whatever they want, they changed it to in Proto 3 to make everything optional. So, and since everything is optional, you can remove the whole keywords of optional and required and remove the, the presence logic. Um, that made a lot of people very angry. <laughs> and it was a pretty breaking change, but the, um, the idea of everything is optional, it appeals to me and I think it's the right thing to do. So they just should have done it in the beginning, but alas, everything you start with is terrible. Um, so yeah, they had loads of prediction, uh, production uh, issues, that's why they removed it, and now everything, everybody has the same fun with making everything optional. That's why I also would suggest if you start out with it to already start with Proto 3, and if you start with Proto 2 and migrate later, it won't, will be terrible. Um, and since it's also a few Java developers in here, um, I made a small example just to show how you could um, work with this in, a, in your traditional Spring Boot application. So let's put Gradle aside. Um, don't focus too much on, on the details, but you just need a few dependencies for, from Google. They're all provided. And we have our very simple controller and I'll just do the publish thing. So this sample application is, I stole it from a colleague because I can. Um, it's, it's a tracking, st an event store that takes in tracking events. Imagine you're some, some simple IoT device or something sending all your tracking events to, to some server. And if you want to accept protobuf, what in, in Spring Boot, there's no request mapping, unfortunately. What you have to do to take in things is you take in a byte array and this is the generated class from show you the that thing first this is our event syntax so we have an event that has ID date and category 
and from there on you get this tracking event generated from the from the compiler it's like it's a bit verbose it can do a lot of things but it exists and you don't have to worry about it it has a nice parse from method and um, it will give you a nice a nice class where you can work with that uh, that's very nice and then if you just um, this is kind of hard in the presentation mode. Where's my view? Ah, screw it. It's always something that's going wrong. So, um, Exactly. IntelliJ has some nice scratch files. So for once, um, this is how you would uh, write to uh, write just to I don't know to file system. The easiest thing you can come on and change around. Um, you have a builder pattern again, just to set it and then dump into in any output stream. That's how you can integrate to pretty much everything. And now if we want to take a file, um, this from the scratch thing, I did uh, this event file. That's a seriali serialized version of our protobuf. And I can post it back. If my application was running, I could actually post it back. But I stopped it. Now I don't do any live coding because this would take too much time, but you find all the samples then later on GitHub and you can look at them uh, without any hurry. So, wonderful. If we post it to our event store, this not sure if you ever all seen the the scratch functionality of IntelliJ. It's pretty nice for HTTP testing. We did post as application type text our our byte representation, and it was successfully stored. And this is not serialized, but here we get suddenly an event from today. Very nice. So integration in in the Java ecosystem is is pretty good. Pretty pretty straightforward. So, so got to hurry up. Um, next one we have on our agenda is Thrift, which is not just a protocol. It's, it's a whole thing. It's an RPC framework, essentially. So if you want to compare it, it's more gRPC than it is protobuf. But since they don't uh, provide it separately, I, if you do Thrift, you do the whole thing, or you at, at least get dependencies for the whole thing and then just work with subparts of it. Um, so it's still in, in definition language and a binary communication protocol, but it, it brings along in its backpack a whole RPC framework. It has conceptual, because they read the same papers back in the days, very much similarities to protobuf. It was originally developed at Facebook, and but they didn't include it that much in their system, so they abandoned it, then the community picked it up, which um, and then later, Facebook reinvented it once more as FB Thrift, and nobody cared about that. Um, so, for for the Java integration, there's some Apache Thrift stuff existing, but since an RPC framework, you're building the whole the whole shebang of it. And I added you a sample from from somebody who showed shows you very nicely how to do exactly what I showed you on the protobuf sample for Java, so you can just use Thrift in a nice way. And for the Scala word, Twitter picked up the Slack instead of after Facebook abandoned it and supplies now roughly everything you need around uh, Thrift. So if, if you look at the schema of Thrift, you see some pretty, pretty big similarities. You still have a namespace definition, it looks different. Um, data types are smallishly different, but it's roughly the same struct uh, similarity. 
you still have an, an order or ID ID fields. The only thing you Im immediately remember, this one is still around. So Thrift has the uh, required and optional semantic, whereas Protobuf dropped it. So that's that's their main difference if you wanna if you wanna look at it protocol wise. And in in Scala, mm, let's check it out. If you want to look at how you would work with it, they they supply a lot of stuff because again, it's an RPC framework. Um, so you have even the protocol factory because you have different serialization mechanisms inside the whole thing. Um, so I'm using the binary protocol here, but, um, and here the the generated class from from our schema. So believe me, here's the here's the the schema I showed you. I get a case class from that, and they supply all. And it's it's kind of similar in in Java that they supply methods to to write it to a buffer, to encode it, and to write it then in the end to the file system or to a, to an output stream or wherever you want to write it. And reading kind of similar. You need a lot of ecosystem stuff from them. It's not so much uh, Java file and Java I/O stuff, but it behaves remarkably similar. So, and again, don't focus too much on the details of the code. You can read them up later. It's just to get a rough feeling of what do you need to do to read in a file and to read out a file. And if you want to do the same thing in Spring Boot, like I showed you, it works pretty analogous. I don't, I don't want to bore you with too much repetition. I have so many windows. Um, and now, if you check the encoding on disk, it's again Similar but different. Same, same but different. Um, here we are. Um, first, you have uh, the the type annotation or uh, a starting byte. You have the ID, which it it hints already that it's intended for a bit larger messages because the the number of fields has a bit more room here, right? You can. You have four digits to represent your uh, your field ID, and then you have one, two, three, four bytes to represent the length. So you can do some pretty long languages with that stuff. But um, again, it's it's halfway the same thing as Protobuf. You have an ID, you have a data type, and you have a length description, and then comes uh, comes the actual payload, and then it starts again with a marker byte with with the ID with a length, and it's always four bytes. And then comes um, the actual payload, and then they fill it up to make it 32 bytes, to make it a nice round number, because we like nice round numbers. So to summarize it, it's, it's more than serialization. It's a whole RPC framework. So if you want to think about RPC frameworks, Thrift is a nice competitor to gRPC. They just don't give that many talks about it. And they have a whole family of encodings that you can use. In, if you're in the Scala ecosystem, you need to choose if you want to work with something that is supported by Twitter. And if they want to keep supporting it forever, otherwise uh, it's fine. And it's remarkably similar to Protobuf, also from the performance aspects. It's just the nearly same thing from two different uh, contenders. Now we have one odd one in the bunch, Avro, which started as a sub-project of Hadoop because Thrift was a bad fit for Hadoop and the Hadoop workload, right? We have now just been talking about inter-process or cross-process communication and not so much about long-term big file stuff. And Hadoop well, what it does, it writes gigantic files all over a distributed system and then tries to read it again. And this is a bit a different use case. Um, it started as an Apache project, it's now supported by Confluent, and it has really different inner workings. Mm. So you have two schemas, you have a reader and a writer schema, and they can be different. That's how they make their... Um, uh, forward compatibility and there's less time information for the payload because the payload is then just squish it together 
because the schema knows about types. And because you've seen in Protobuf the, and in Thrift, the serialization had type information, and for Avro, this is not the case. And you don't have to assign fields because the schema also has the, the, the ordering. And yeah, it boils down to different schemas for reading and writing, and that makes a lot of sense for them because they want to be more dynamic. Because Hadoop works on reading everything you could potentially throw at it, and it tries to make sense out of it, which is the bigger use case than having everything slimmed down. So if you want to look at a schema, it's also similar. It's um, if you want to make things something optional, you make it's kind of an awkward thing, but you can do it. You can make things optional. The rest is is required here. A schema uh, namespace information. And now, and here's some sample about Java usage. You just have to this time for the Maven fans. Um, and the sample is linked, li linked under there. Pre pretty straightforward like the rest, but it has one, and I'll, I'll skip the, jo the SPT one. Um, it has a remarkable difference because it's bigger. The, the thing is, the schema, the reader schema needs to be somewhere because you don't exchange the same, same schema anymore, but you have two. So that you gotta, to read, you gotta have a schema. So where do you find it? And in the default implementation, you just put the schema in the serialized file. Now, if you are Hadoop and you're writing a terabyte big file, you don't care for the few bytes of the, pay of the schema payload, right? You just put it in the front, and you know everybody who will read it will get it. Um, if you're sending short RPC-style messages, it's terrible, because you're sending the schema over, over all the time. So if you look at the representation, on disk of our of our file, it's big. It's <laughs> essentially very big if you want to look at it. Um, so it looks almost like a Java serialized thing, but just in a non-breaking way. It tells us what what there is. It's a record. It has a namespace. It has fields. It's an array of fields, and then it has data. So. Whoever comes along without knowing about my schema could read this data, which is a, a nice thing if, if I don't want to talk to this person. But it's a bad thing if I have to keep this amount of bytes over the wire, right? It's 294 bytes compared to the 20-something bytes, uh, 24 bytes of Protobuf. So again, depends a lot on your use case. So. If you don't want this, they also have a solution, which is the, the one I have the most issues with I, in, in this whole talk, is you can remove afterwards the schema again and put it into a schema registry. So if you want to exchange the information about the schema, you can have a registry running somewhere and just reference your schema in the beginning of the message. And then someone else has to get the message, has to fetch the schema from the registry and make sense out of your data. Um, so, I, I'm really conflicted about introducing another runtime dependency in my system, right? About changing things later, yeah. and I have one more thing that breaks and one more thing that can annoy me. I, I'm conflicted. So if you want to do RPC-style communication, I would advise you maybe to think carefully about using Avro. But if you're doing a Hadoop-style use case where you write a lot of big files and you don't care about this, like less amount of messages, but bigger messages, it might make sense again, right? It's, it's again, it's up to you. I cannot give you a, this one is good and this one is bad description. I can show you how they work and you make the decision in the end for yourself. Um, yeah, this, uh, this wraps it up. One more. Um, we have support for dynamically generated schemas. You can generate it, somebody else can read it. That works really nice with dynamically typed languages. And also having the schema in there works nice with dynamically typed languages compared to Java and Scala where you want to type everything. Um, and yeah, downside is you either have the protocol overhead or you have a runtime dependency. And if you have two different versions of the schema, you also need to test that the different versions somehow make sense together. right? Um, and they, they offer a test kit for that, but it's again something you need to take care of if you want to migrate your schema forward. In Protobuf and Thrift, 
there's just no way to make an inco incompatible thing if you because of the numbered fields. So, and last one in the bunch, it's cryo, which is again a bit an odd one because it doesn't have a schema. Um, <laughs> It's an object graph serialization framework for the JVM without schema evolution, but it's really, really fast. If you want to uh, communicate messages RPC style from one JVM to another one, this is the good thing. So for things like you're building a cluster, who doesn't build clusters in their free time? Um, for ACA, for example, that's where I used it. It's, it's really fast, it's really stable, it's really good. Um, I've used it before in serialized messages to a message bus. That's not good because, again, you have the evolution part and the evolution problem. So don't do this. It really goes for running process-to-process -process communication. That, that's where it's really nice. Um, I copied the Java sample from, from the Cryo page. It's, again, it's really easy to work with. They bring you constructors. Um, it's, it essentially, compared to the schema where you describe your message, they will just take the ACME message, like whatever that is, they just take it. Like whatever it is, they just take it and, and serialize it. And hopefully it comes out unharmed at the other end. Um, and deserializing is, is the same thing. So... Yeah, for really, really quick stuff, this is a good call. And yeah, with, with Scala, you t uh, Twitter is also supporting Chill. They're, they're a very friendly bunch, br bringing up a few libraries. Um, let's let's skip the sample because we're running short on time. You can read it up later, and it's it's all in on GitHub. Uh, if you just check the encoding on disk. Marvel again once at the at the mightiness of Avro and the schema, and this is this is Cryo, where you can see with my botched up last name and the funky characters, they it's really really condensed. They they if they can fit it in half a byte they do, and then they put something else in, and that's what makes it 16 bytes instead of 24 on on Protobuf, and you cannot read it anymore on with your funky tool, so. If you really need to read things on the wire, if you're that no nosy, then don't go with cryo. And anyone from Real Logic here, from London? Luckily, because uh, otherwise they would be angry. Um, there's one more, one more in our row. It's uh, the simple binary encoding from Real Logic. They're also from the high frequency trading space, and what they do is also crazy fast. It's an yeah, Aussie Layer 6 representation. Essentially, also, they have their own serialization and deserialization protocol inside their real logic suite. Um, the reason why I'm not going to dive into it is for once there's not enough time for never, never but um, it's also not as easy to set up. Like, it's, I couldn't fit it on some nice lights. And um, the the downside is I don't really understand what comes out of the wire, so I couldn't uh, I could not nicely explain it to you on the slides. So if I if anyone knows about this stuff, uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards and we hack it uh, together. Um, but yeah, their stuff. They also have a framework called Aaron, where you well, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but th that stuff it really integrates well with that. It's really really fast and it supports schema evolution. So if you want to build high frequency trading stuff. Go for it. I just um, I just choose not to integrate it because the integration is not so simple. The ease of use is compared to, to performance. For most systems, probably not not the thing you need, but for some systems it might be. And I cannot dissect the bytes on the wire. I have no idea what happens there. Um, so to sum it up, if you want to look at Protobuf. Um, the integration is really good. The concepts are really fine. The, the version change from 2 to 3 was a bit of a mess. People were a bit angry. People were a bit startled. Um, same goes, the same concept goes for Thrift. Like the, the concepts are pretty nice. Uh, it's, it's a bigger framework than Protobuf, like I said. It's more competitive to gRPC. And the integrations are... Mm -hmm. 
not so nice. Goes for Java as well as Scala. Scala. Uh, in Arrow, the integration are, are nice. It's good for big files, if you want to see, or big messages. And the whole embedded schema concept, I, I like that emoticon. That's, that, that's my opinion on that. Um, and for Cryo, you have amazing speed, you have amazing simplicity, you have no evolvability, and it's definitely not something you want to persist later. So that should give you a matrix of wherever you need to go with your system, what you might want to pick. Again, and I repeat myself, don't use Java serialization. Please, don't. Any of this, or whatever else, but not, not serialization. Promise me that, please. Um, one last word of caution. The required keyword, and that's why Google did it, and schema evolution thingy don't mix well. Trust me, you will see, right? In the beginning, it sounds really nice to require things, and uh, test it out really good. If for with whatever you start, might be even a whole different framework than, than what I showed you. But if it has a required thing, think carefully. Um, relevant links, if you want to read more. Um, of course, everybody needs to read uh, Effective Java. And then there's this fantastic book from, from Martin Klappmann called Designing Data Intensive Application. It ca came out ye last year, and I think it's the best book of the last five years. It's, it's tremendous. Everything I said is like a fourth of a chapter, and it's such a book full of gigantic good information. So if you're designing big systems, designing any kind of system, please read this book. It's full of great, great information. And he also wrote a nice blog post where we, we could, uh, you could read up some of the things I said about Avro protocol buffers and, and Thrift. That is also a nice overview about the topics covered in this talk. So, I think we're, we're now good uh, for some questions. My Twitter handle is Chris, so if you want to talk to me later, use this one. Example slides, everything else is here in this GitHub repository. You find all of that. Um, I work for MapMatch building a, a really cool material search engine. We're, we're cloud native, we release five times a day with five people, so if you want to talk about that later offline. I'm also happy to, happy to have a chat. Uh, keep, keep the questions about serialization, though. Um, this, this should be it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Kind of rushed through it, but thank you. <laughs> so do we have any questions? Do we have a microphone to pass around? You can also have coffee and just go. Yep. <laughs> just leave. Uh, <laughs> just thank you so much for the great talk. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. So, oh. a quick comment on Broadabuff. So, the issue where, that I see. Are you? <laughs> Sorry? Oh, there you yeah. are. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So, a quick comment on Broadabuff. So, the issue we see uh, well, when working with it, I mean, we have a Java application. And mm -hmm. one issue that we see is that the way Broadabuff generates models is that it makes them a class. So it doesn't expose an interface in any kind. So mm -hmm. this is a huge issue uh, when it comes to the design because it just uh, forces you to marry Protobuf and to integrate uh, it into your service layer, which is super inconvenient. I mm -hmm. heard that it's different in Scala, <clears throat> like there is a trait or something that is being generated. But like, uh, as for Java, it's a huge inconvenience. So what they should have done is they should uh, put an interface and then created a class that just is implementation. They're not doing that. And like if you take Spring, Spring is all about interfaces. A huge issue. So my question is, uh, as, as it comes to other fra fra frameworks, do they provide you with an interface or they just generate classes? Um, as far as Thrift and, and Avro goes, uh, they provide you classes. Um, what I might suggest is, uh, what I did in, in my sample, is to usually not use much of the classes in your application code, because you don't want to pollute your layers too much. But um, since we're 
Java developers we, we like abstractions um, to maybe work with some mappers and uh, DTOs that you can interface later on which it's another layer but you, you can it forces yeah. you to you, you yeah just but uh, this is my point so the inconvenience goes with uh, in that it forces you to like have another layer of map mappers and you have to support them and it's a real pain so this the issue hmm? Uh, thank you again for the talk. Uh, so, I, I haven't seen, uh, I was a bit late, sorry, but I haven't seen uh, any mention about message pack. So, uh, did you use it, try it comparing to anything else in here? So, I know it's pretty compact, but uh, how is comparing to everything else? Um, the reason I didn't include it is I don't have any, I don't know enough about it. So, the, I didn't talk about it because I don't have enough lo knowledge. Uh, that's that's why I skipped it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Looks that we're good. Um, I'll be here at the conference all day. If you wanna, if you have any additional questions or wanna discuss something, feel free to approach me. Um,